Well, good morning. It is good to be here morning with you this morning. I was traveling last week for the and attending the Loving Lectures. And I'm glad to be back here with you this morning. Our lesson this morning comes from 1 Kings chapters 10 and chapter 11. Looking at different events that Solomon recorded in other places within the Old Testament, various aspects of his life are recorded uh, within the books of history. But we're going to focus for our time together this morning from 1 Kings chapter 10 and in verse 11. But before we actually get into that, I want us to turn first to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4 of, of Solomon as well. I want us to notice before we even get into the text, the, the body really of our lesson, I want us to notice the words from Proverbs 4 verse 23. Reading from the King James, the Bible says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the You know, when you think about Solomon, you think of a few things. One is you think of his wisdom. He was one who asked for wisdom. He was regarded, at least for a time, as one of the wisest men who ever walked the earth. He also was regarded as one of the wealthiest men who walked the earth. He also was regarded as one of the men of the most wise, the men who ever walked the earth. Solomon, to put it mildly, had issues. He made some wise decisions at various points in his life, but also he made some very drastically decisions as well. So I want us to look at this together this morning. I want to show what we can learn from the mistakes of one of the wisest men who ever walked the earth. And as we begin looking at Solomon, we're going to look at Solomon's fame and then also his sin. Because he was very famous, he was very well known for his wisdom that he did receive from God. We know that as we look at first panic on me, but we're going to look at a lot of uh, portions of this in 1 Kings 10 and 1 Kings 11. In 1 Kings chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, going through verse 10, we find that the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon because of his wisdom. That's why she traveled to, to visit him. Was the name of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to, to test him with hard questions. Now, it's interesting. When you think of hard questions, what comes to your mind? Probably what comes to your mind might be a little bit different than what comes to my mind. Well, what may come to someone else's mind. But we find here in verse 2, a verse that came to him uh, with various parables and riddles because the Arabs at that time at least loved to deal with riddles. Is that true? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. But whatever it was she came to him with, she regarded them as hard questions that she needed answers for. For a great, not say massive uh, array of people that came with her. She came with her, you might say, with great pomp and circumstance, right? She had a whole crowd with her, gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. Is it dangerous for a man and a woman to be in a private setting and want to open up the heart to another? Yeah, it is a dangerous setting, isn't it? Now, the Bible's revealed they actually were alone. But when a woman is wrong, but sometimes some bad things can happen. But just keep that in mind as we continue reading here. Verse 3, so Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. Where did the wisdom of Solomon come from? It came from God. What he asked for from God was for wisdom. And no doubt God granted his wisdom. And as we're going to go through this, we're going to find that that didn't keep Solomon from making some terrible decisions. So we find in verse 3, there's nothing too difficult for the king that he could not explain it to her. He was so wise he could explain anything to her. That's the idea in verse 3. So, the house that he had built, the food on his table, and the seating of his servants, meaning the mass amount of servants that he had, right? The service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entryway which, by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there is no more spirit in her, wealth of Solomon. And so you put it in her mind, she has this man who answers every question she has, and he is extremely wealthy. All these things. In verse 6, then she said to the king, 
It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. There's the fame, right? About your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. Indeed, the half was not told to me, meaning what was told to me did it in prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever, and therefore he made you king to do what Solomon should be doing. Why was he in that position? Because of God. What should he be doing? To do justice and righteousness. Verse 9. Keep in mind that verse, because as we continue through this, we're going to find that's not exactly what it's saying. 120 talents of gold, like he needed that, right? Spices in great quantity and precious stones. There never again came such abundance of spices that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Notice verse 13 of the same chapter. Now King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired. Whatever she asked, the servant went to her own country, she and her servants. Whatever she asked, she got. Whatever common things that ladies in the Old Testament wanted, children. Some would say that, that Queen of Sheba and Solomon had a child together. The Bible is not clear on that. I won't go so far and say they definitely did. But one uh, commentator said this, that uh, a man with the title of King of Kings of Ethiopia, line of Judah, elect of God, visited Washington on one occasion uh, back in the early 1900s. This man explained his title as often reports that. Is that correct? We have no idea. The Bible doesn't say that. But it is interesting and to think about. I'm not saying that it is what, take, what took place, but it is a possibility. Does it matter if that is the case? It would just only show how wicked Solomon was, as we're going to find later. Really, he had hundreds on that. Solomon's enormous wealth also was seen in 1 Kings chapter 10. The shield we find in 1 Kings 10 to verse 16, uh, verses 14 through 17, rather. This is second. Notice it says, The weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. That's a lot of gold, isn't it? And it came to him not once, but it came to, year, came to him on a yearly basis. Now, if you jump ahead to 1 Kings 13, when the new king was to come on, it wanted their burden lightened. And so it would seem that during Solomon's reign, at least to their point of view, was that Solomon was very burdensome to them in, a, in the area of taxes and what he required of them. Which could be possible because we find... Notice what else in verse 15 Besides that, from the traveling merchants, from the income of the traders, from all the kings of Arabia, and from the governors of the country. And King Solomon made 200 large shields of hammered gold. 200 large, large shields. That means they took gold, they hammered it into a shield. 200 of them. Verse 17, he also made 300 shields of hammered gold. Three miners of gold went into each shield. The king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. They weren't actually used for anything, but just put on display. That's a massive amount of gold, isn't it? Some estimated each. Uh, verse 16, if you're looking at verse 17, whether you're talking about the ones in verse 16 or verse 17, but it came up into the millions of dollars spent on just these shields for these shields of gold. You think about this for a second. And instead of using shields of gold and creating these shields of gold, what could Solomon have done instead? <clears throat> you think his people would have loved him more if he turned around to help those who were in need? Solomon had direction you can imagine. And what does he do? He makes them into ornaments and puts them on displays in various ways. That's what Solomon does. <clears throat> We find as we continue on here in, in 1 Kings chapter 10 that Solomon also at 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 through 10. As we go back to the idea of Solomon and his wealth, notice the words of the Apostle Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 verses 9 and 10. He says, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and they stare into many foolish and kinds of evil. If we go back and look at all the wealth that Solomon had, do you think he had a love of money? 
It's hard to argue that he didn't. As you continue reading through there, you see all the things that he did with it and the throne that he would create, as we'll see here in a moment, on all these shields of gold. He didn't seem to mind having it around and giving it to no one except people. I think verse 56 and verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Does this only apply to the New Testament age? No. It applied to the time period of Solomon as well. His wealth was something that he used in ways that we've talked about the shield. Just go on to 1 Kings chapter 10, this time picking up verse 18, looking at Solomon and his throne. 1 Kings 10, beginning in verse 18, Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory, and overlaid it with pure gold. The throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round at the back. There were armrests on either side of the place of the seat, and statues like a lion. It says two lions, doesn't it? Twelve lions stood there, one on each side, verse 20, of the six steps. Nothing like this had been seen for any other kingdom. Can you imagine your mind walking into this throne room and seeing an ivory throne covered in gold? You think that man wants you to know who is in charge and how powerful that he is and the money that he has? I don't see I can say anything else, at least in part. A lot of wealth sunk into just his own throne room. He was doing these things to be like the nations around him, which God had commanded him not to do. He a throne as well. Let's look at some of Solomon's troubles, which we've already touched on a little bit here. As you look at 1 Kings chapter 11, we think about Solomon's troubles. We first begin with his wives and his idolatry, because they do go hand in hand, at least in Solomon's case. Because his wives would pull, he let off, it would seem very willingly, into idolatry. 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, going through verse 4. But King Solomon loved many foreign women. There's one problem, right? One, he loved many women. Told back in Deuteronomy, as we'll see here in a moment, Deuteronomy chapter 7, not to, to marry with foreign women, not to take foreign wives. Why? Because God said so. That's all you need to know. That's what God told him to do. Not to do those things. What does Solomon do? He doesn't just marry one. He marries many of them. As well as the daughter of Pharaoh, there in verse, verse 1, in Hittites, for the nations of whom the Lord has said to the children of Israel, you shall not enter bear with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Big problem. Because God warned them, look, you marry these types of people, they're going to lead you off into idolatry, and you're going to do what? You're going to lose your clearly on several occasions in a continuous action. And what was he doing? He was not turning from it. If sin separates man from God, someone's actions being sinful, he needed to repent of those things in order to be spared eternal destruction, didn't he? Is how someone clung to these in love. You could say his wife. I think you could also say, as we'll find later, he clung to their idolat idolatrous idols as well. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. God, so notice that God is little g there in verse 4. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father. David, David had turned away from God, didn't he? The Bible says he was not fully following God. Look at Deuteronomy 7, 3 and 4. Driving the point home, back, going back to what was quoted in 1 Kings 11. They should not, you shall not make, your, make marriages with them. You should not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. Rouse against you and destroy you suddenly. Does that sound like God will condemn him for what he's doing? Absolutely. Absolutely. Solomon went after idols and was not fully following God. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 5 through 8. Where Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the city. In the sight of the Lord, and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. We know they didn't stop there. Notice what someone did. You got 700 wives who fall after, fall after idols and false gods. Can you imagine having 700 people just wives alone and trying to keep happy? 
What does Solomon do? Verse 7. He built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives, 700. Is he faithful to God? Not in those things. He's not faithful to God. He cannot turn and worship other gods. Matthew chapter 6, verse 4 tells us what? No one can serve two masters, for he will, either he will hate the one and love the other, for else he will be his way, wasn't he? Someone once said, if, if, well, has once said, if the heart is corrupt, so will be the behavior. If the heart is corrupt, so will be the behavior. What was Solomon doing? Enjoying his earthly pleasures and taking joys in them, allowing them to be something he no doubt put too much priority in. He took multiple wives. He was following after idols. He was building up altars for them with his wives. He was not a servant of God anymore. How could you say that he was? The Lord said he was not fully serving him, which means at least he, perhaps he's doing some things. But here's the question. Could, he could not partially be pleased with Solomon. God was not partly pleased with Solomon. He was solely displeased because Solomon was trying to be on two teams. There is only one for the faithful follower of God. Solomon doesn't sound like he's okay with him, does it? Because his heart had turned the Lord God of Israel. Now it says he has turned. Not that he's no longer just not fully following him. His heart has turned. Notice what else there in verse 9. Who had appeared to him twice appeared to us in a way that he appeared to Solomon even just once. The Bible says he appeared to Solomon twice. But for Solomon that wasn't enough. Apparently was it? I'm sure he would say, you know, he might say differently, well that's not really what happened. Well that does seem like it, doesn't it? It's hard to argue that he was trying to do what was right. The Bible points out, we saw earlier he was doing this in his old age. But as we find here in verses 9 through 11, what was happening? Look at verse 10. And had commanded him, and this is the he had commanded him concerning the very things which he was doing, that he should not go after other gods, and he did not keep the Lord had commanded. He did not keep. It was not he had turned from the Lord God of Israel. Does that sound like a man who is a faithful servant of God? No. Verse 11, therefore the Lord says, I commanded you. He says, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. The Bible goes on to say there in verse 12, the following, he would do it at a later date, right? It was going to be taken away, thus the divided kingdom, right? <clears throat> Wisdom and wealth, if you think about Solomon, it does not guarantee spiritual wisdom. Solomon, you might say, proved that he was a wise and children, what it was. And the line, one character said to another was, you're the smartest dumb person I've ever met. Well, the dumbest smart person I've ever met, so that backwards. You're the uh, uh, yeah, dumbest smart person I've ever met. Well, Solomon, that could be said, said the same way, right? He was very wise. He just didn't listen to his own words, right? His own words or wrongdoing. is a monster of so frightful men. As to be hated needs to be seen, means a man needs to be seen hating wickedness. Yet too oft, familiar with her face, meaning we're too familiar with evil, will first endure, I don't know, we pity those who are in it, then we join right in. That's what Solomon had done, right? He had joined right in. Once entrenched in sin, it is difficult to come out of it. We find, to continue on, which we're not going to read, you can on your own, when you find the end of chapter 11, adversaries would come against Solomon to try to drive him to repentance. Why is this happening? Because you're not walking with God. But Solomon did not change. His lifestyle seemed to remain the same. We're not given any details specifically of the, of the success of his adversaries. Let's notice next the, you might say the build-up or the prelude into, into apostasy. We go back to 1 Kings chapter 10 as we think about these things and realize that apostasy is seldom an instant in the other direction. That's not very common that you see that. No, what happens is you find there is a build-up to it. Solomon gets wise. He gets, at least in my mind, a little too comfortable. He starts collecting wealth. 
People start looking up to him. He starts taking foreign wives. And before you know it, the Lord says, that's right, to paraphrase there in chapter 10 and chapter 11. The steps are gradual and often unnoticed by the individual. And in the own words of Solomon will condemn him from Proverbs 16 and verse 18. If I had a nose before destruction and a high spirit before a fall. Wealth, among other things, will lead men astray. Wealth often, but not always, will lead men astray. A disrespect for God's commands will lead one to apostasy. Faith from God. We must purge ourselves from those individuals or those things that will pull us away from God. Solomon didn't do that, did he? Now the Bible says he clung to them, talking about his wives, or he can make the argument his those idols which they will lead him away to. He clung to them in love, didn't he? He clung to them. Who are we to cling to? You know, the same book, to the Lord your God, for he is your life and the length of your days. Believe Jeremiah chapter 20. Solomon was not doing that. He was clinging to the wrong persons. He was clinging to persons instead of clinging to God. Solomon's love for strange women brought him about, brought, brought about his downfall as much, perhaps more than any other single factor. I mean, his wives it could have been the most, the biggest factor of all. Were they the only ones? No, they weren't the only factor in it. The Bible clearly states his wives led him into idolatry. Solomon's dive into apostasy was enhanced by his. He was wealthy. He was wise. Not that wealthy made him. Wise or anything like that, but he was wise. He knew, the, he knew the Lord. He shouldn't ever marry those women at all, should he? No. He could have very easily found a bride, which would be good. Once a principle is violated, compromise becomes increasingly easier. Once a principle is violated, compromise becomes increasingly easier. It is sad that Solomon did not follow his own inspired advice. Screams the issues of life. Solomon should listen to his own words, shouldn't he? That's right. He should have paid attention to what was going on. You know, he could have stopped and sent all those women packing at any moment, but he didn't. He could have stopped and burned all those things down, but he didn't. Instead, he clung to them in love. Some lessons for us today. Anyone can depart from God. Anyone can depart from God for a host for a whole host. You know, the book of Ecclesiastes is credited to him many times. When he talks about wherever his eyes be held, he did not keep from him, and he could have whatever he wanted. Sounds like Solomon. But it didn't bring him any pleasure. Solomon had wisdom, wealth, and physical pleasures. However, he did not have God. His unfaithfulness was spent looking for fulfillment and happiness, seeming to never find it. Didn't he? We, those who think about lessons for us today, how anyone can depart from God. Secondly, we should not disobey God for anything or encouragement cause us to disobey God. We can get away from it. You know, I hear people say it all the time. I've heard it for a long time, especially among those who are younger, those with children. They'll say, well, we want them to be a good influence on, on them. Okay, that's fine. Temptation of sin from their friends around them. And sometimes we can be bold until our children find out people hang out with, don't we? And sometimes as adults, we have to make the big decision to say, you know what, I'm not hanging around with that person anymore. Because I'm, all, I'm constantly being tempted to sin. So why don't we hang around with them? Solomon clung to these wives and loved. Solomon disobeyed God to pursue pleasure only to fail. Solomon disobeyed God for women whom he loved, but in return it would seem from, from the scriptures that they only wanted him to become like them, which is idolaters. Is it really the next life, the next life, the next concubine, whatever it may be, all those women? Solomon was a very foolish, wise person. We must live life being willing to make every sacrifice needed to be pleasing to God. There's, if there are certain things we're not willing to do for God, friends, how can we say that we really love the Lord?
If there's some things we see that we are not going to do, that's just too much, that's asking too much of me and to change too much, I'd upset too many people. Some had 700 wives plus. And the point being this, he doesn't seem to upset anybody. Except, uh, except the Lord. The most important person of all is the one he chose to, to upset. The one who matters the most, or chapter 11 rather for a moment. Do you think about those words concerning him from the Lord in 1 Kings chapter 11? When you think about those things which the Lord has said to him, verse 9, 1 Kings 11. And the Lord was very angry and saw unto him twice. That's who Solomon chose to upset. The Lord. Friends, we're going to upset someone. We don't need to, we need to pick somebody else besides God, don't we? We need to pick somebody else besides the Lord. We think about that for us today sometimes. But friends, there is a line we must draw. We must not draw it with pencil. We must draw it with ink that we will not cross. We cannot disobey God in order to please others. And at the same time, thank God to be pleased with us work for Him. So the question becomes then, are you making such sacrifices? Are you making the sacrifices needed to be pleasing to God? If there is sin in your life, you are really and ready to root it out. If there are those around you who are encouraging to do sin, are you willing to handle it? Talk with them, help them try to consider some of their actions, and if not, walk away. One thing they all had in common, in order to be a learner of Christ, they had to walk away from some things, didn't they? They had to walk away from those who would tempt them. They had to walk people in order to follow Christ. Look at John chapter 6. In about verse 66 and verses leading up to verse 66, you find that Christ, by his teachings on people, lest they would drink of his blood and eat of his flesh, which is foreshadowing the Lord's Supper, which we, which we took of already today. And unless they did those things, they, they cannot have it, right? And the Bible tells us that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Were they willing to sacrifice things so they would be, be a follower of Christ? Only to a certain point. But do you remember Peter's response? In the midst of a time of people, when people were literally walking away from Christ. You remember what Peter said? Christ asked him, are you too going to walk? Where else are we going to go? He says, for you have the words of eternal life. Friends, if we walk away from God, where else are you going to go? Only back into the world and back into a position where hell is a very real reality. Think about these things. The Bible tells us we must do in order to put on Christ. The Bible tells us we must hear the word of God. We must believe it. We must believe that Christ is the Son of God. We must repent of our sins, confessing that Christ is the Son of God as well. Being immersed in baptism, rising up in newness of life, as the book of Romans tells us there, is at the same time we are placed in the body of Christ in our journey to the, to the heavenly home. And if we are a Christian, we know that sometimes we can make mistakes. But we will confess those things to God. Repent of those things to God. The Bible tells us He is faithful and just to forgive us of those things and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This means heaven and to miss hell. We can help you anyway. You can come forward now. Let's see how we stand and sing the song that's been selected.